I'm Roland Oliphant, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today we bring you updates from the battlefront, analyse North Korea's reported decision to send engineering troops to Ukraine, and discuss Volodymyr Zelensky's visit to Brussels, where he's to sign a security pact with the European Union. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Thursday, the 27th of June, two years and 129 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by Berlin correspondent James Rothwell. If you're wondering where David, Dom and Francis are, they're at the Chalk Valley History Festival in Wiltshire, where they are discussing rhetoric versus reality in the Ukraine war. I started with the latest military updates from Ukraine. Starting in the northeastern end of the line, um, up at that Russian foothold, I think Dom calls it a lodgment in the Kharkiv region near Vovchansk. Uh, the Center for Defense Strategies Ukrainian think tank says that Ukrainian forces advanced inside Vovchansk along Saborna Street in the city center. Uh, the battles continue near Lipsy, Klyabokia and Tikia. So that continues this slow Ukrainian advance, Russian retreat from those areas that we've seen in the past few days. Uh, Don was talking about this yesterday. If you want to look at that, look up yesterday's podcast. Essentially, the situation is that the Russian offensive there that began in May, they came across the border in two areas. It basically seems to have failed to develop in the way that was planned. Those two salients never met up and Ukrainians have been pushing back over well, several days a week. Um, the momentum is very much on, on the Ukrainian side over there. Also in Kharkiv region, uh, Ukrainian border guards repelled a Russian sabotage team, apparently trying to launch a cross-border attack on a village. Local state border official, yesterday the enemy attempted to conduct military operations in the direction of the settlement of Sotnitsky Kozachok in the Kharkiv region. A sabotage and reconnaissance group was operating, which entered the territory of Ukraine. A shooting battle ensued. And uh, this was preceded by enemy shelling from other weapons. Uh, the border guards have repelled this attack at the moment. Moving further south down the line, multiple assaults, Russian assaults, still reported in the Kupiansk area and the Liman areas. Um, Russian pressure is still being kept up. Um, up and down the line and, and in those areas. Nine Russian attempts, uh, at least at least uh, by evening yesterday, repelled in the Chasiv Yar area. As we know, Chasiv Yar is one of the big strategic towns and objectives of uh, this summer's Russian offensive. Battle's still going on there. Chasiv Yar remains in Ukrainian hands for now. South of Chasiv Yar, and I'm going to dwell here for a little bit, the town of Teretsk, which is a, a mining town on a ridge that was long kind of how do you put it neglected by the war it was, it was it was fairly peaceful and fairly calm on that part of the front for a long time about 10 days ago the russians launched an offensive in that area and they've been making progress so russian forces again cds think tank uh, russian forces reached the outskirts of pivnichnya after capturing shumi those are two villages just north uh, east of Turetsk itself launched several airstrikes on Ukrainian defense forces positions in Turetsk using uh, 11 KAP bombs, so glide bombs. Now, the assessment, uh, CDS's assessment of, of this attack is that the goal, the Russians' goal, is to capture Turetsk and the small town of New York, uh, not New York City, <laughs> the, the, the small Donbass village that is also called New York, um, to capture Turetsk in New York, to force the Ukrainian forces out of their positions in that area and then advance north and reach Konstantinovka, which is, as I'm sure our regular listeners know, one of those key strategic towns upon which Ukraine's entire defensive posture in the Donbass is anchored on. Um, and the, the battle at Chasiv Yar is also coming in that direction from the other way. So the offensive in Tourette seems quite serious, seems quite a, a key part of, of the Russian plan here. Began about 10 days ago. AFP actually have a dispatch from Tourette today uh, where they've been speaking to local residents and soldiers in the area. I'm just going to read out a little bit of that to give give you a sense of it. So just for context, Tourette, it's a, it's a mining town. It lies on this kind of high ridge. Lots of mines there. It's a very coal-like kind of place um, and it sits behind a part of the front line really the only part of the old front line from the 2014 to 2022 war that hasn't yet been overrun 
So this is from the AFP dispatch. Galina Poroshina and her husband Alexander told the journalists uh, they described taking peace in the town for granted, but the recent surge in Russian attacks has left the town, quote, a dead, broken city, charred Soviet-era housing blocks, ripped open by Russian bombardments. Taretsk, shelling echoes throughout its emptying streets, black smoke rises over the horizon. Now the most important thing is human life to survive, she said, uh, to save even the memory of relatives. It's so painful when you can't go to the cemetery. And then they, they also talked to a 30-year-old commander of a Ukrainian military unit deployed there. He said holding back Russian forces in the area is becoming difficult. Um, they've been dropping devastating guided aerial bombs, sending, uh, launching rockets, using small sabotage teams, that commander said. He also said Ukrainian forces had botched the troop rotation, compromised their defense of the town. Certain mistakes were made. The enemy analyzed and used them, he said, talking about uh, Ukrainian fortifications that the reporters could see behind the city he said he was unconvinced the defensive lines outside the city don't mean anything pointed out russia had captured other towns buttressed by such installations um so that's the those are events around Turetsk, and there is other stuff going on so south of Turetsk, down to the pokrovska direction where the russians are pushing that big salient out towards pokrovska that other key strategic ukrainian town the russians have advanced again in that area They've crossed fields north of a place called Sokel. They hold positions along the uh, 0544 road from Ocheretnya to Pokrovsk. And the assessment is that the Russian forces there will soon, this is this is um, a Center for Defense Strategies, will soon attempt to break through Vozdvizhenka towards the Pokrovsk-Konstantinovka road. Their goal is to cut it off between a place called Malinivka and Novopoltavka, reach the Vovcha River between Pores and Komishivka, and if conditions allow us to establish several bridgeheads. Um, again, we're talking about Konstantinovka here. So that attack through Turetsk, the attack down here to cut the, the road between Pokrovsk and Konstantinovka, the attack towards Chesov Yar, they're all focused on that key river valley where you have Konstantinovka, Kramatorsk and Slavyansk. That is the focus of the big Russian offensive. Um, away from the front, other developments, first reports from Russia. So Ryan, obviously, the Russian state news agency reported this morning that chemical plant in the Tver region, uh, which is northwest of Moscow, was targeted in an overnight drone attack on Thursday. Didn't provide many details. It's a place called the Redkinsky Experimental Plant, which produces a number of chemicals, um, including those used in the aviation and space industries. So another Ukrainian strike against infrastructure inside Russia. Russia also claims to have carried out missile strikes on Ukrainian airfields, which it said were designated to host Western military aircraft. So this is obviously a reference to uh, Ukraine's expected, anticipated uh, receipt of F-16 fighter jets, which they haven't yet received, let's be clear, as far as we know. So Russia said it used sea-based long-range precision weapons, Kinjal hypersonic missiles and drones in the attack. It said all designated targets were hit, but it didn't name them. So this follows uh, footage from June 2022 that appeared to show Russia's Black Sea feet flying caliber cruise missiles at airfields, um, including Vasilkov near Kiev. We are expecting to see F 16s in the skies over Ukraine. Well, we've been told as soon as the end of June or July. Of course, we are at the end of June now. So, no surprise about the timing there. Um, we'll, be, we'll be following the news quite closely to, to, to we'll tell you as soon as we know uh, we have clear signs that those, those aircraft are in the sky in Ukraine. We don't know that they are yet. News from the Ukrainians. Ukraine says that Russia launched 100 glide bombs um, in the past 24 hours. 96 glide bombs, two missiles, 4,000 shells, 44 kamikaze drones fired across the border. Ukraine has also said, well, sorry, um, related to, uh, to, the, to the air war, Dmitry Sakharuk um, from the private Ukrainian energy company DTEC has warned that Ukraine has a critical shortage of air defense missiles, and this is severely limiting efforts to defend key infrastructure from Russian attacks. Russia's, you know, very clear strategy now to try and really grind down Ukraine's energy infrastructure. And last thing from me, the first shipment of artillery ammunition from the Czech-led initiative. Um, so you remember that the Czech Republic was saying, we are going to go around the world buying shells anywhere we can find them on the market to get them to Ukraine. First lot was delivered earlier this month, said Czech Defence Minister Jana Chernochova. 
There were tens of thousands of 155mm shells, that's the standard kind of NATO calibre, financed by Germany. So those shells are finally making it to the front. I am going to, in the words of Dominic, of course, take a pause there. Um, I'd like to come to James Rothwell. James, are you there? Hello, Relis. Give us the, the diplomatic updates um, of the day, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk through the news and what it might mean. Yes, thanks for having me as always on the podcast. Now, there's quite an interesting development on the diplomatic front happening actually over in the Far East, where South Korean media report that North Korea is sending engineering and construction troops to eastern Ukraine to take part in what they characterize as regeneration work or reconstruction work uh, in Russian controlled areas. That's according to TV Chosun, which spoke to a South Korean official. He said the soldiers from North Korea would arrive in July. The North Korean army in total has about 10 divisions. It's not quite clear how many troops are being sent over. But according to Chosun, the North Korean state stands to earn about $115 million per year if it keeps sending troops over to take part in this reconstruction work. Now, there's not currently any indication that these North Korean troops will have combat roles. They've been characterized, as I said, as, as engineers builders, that sort of thing. But the Institute for the Study of War has pointed out that this may have an indirect impact on the availability of Russian troops. They suggested that the arrival of North Korean troops who go onto this constructive work may free up some Russian forces to go back out to the front. So it does appear to be yet another example uh, of a country allying with Putin and giving indirect, but not necessarily direct, uh, military support to the invasion of Ukraine. Also on the diplomatic front, David Cameron uh, has fallen foul of some Russian prank callers. I think you're probably familiar with these two characters, Roland, having covered their antics over the years. They managed to trick Lord Cameron into believing that he was having a discussion with the former Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko. It lasted for about 15 minutes, the British government says, before uh, he realised what was going on. Interesting discussion of this. They seem to have managed to get Lord Cameron onto the subject of Trump's Ukraine plan. Our listeners will know that Trump has been quite sort of, uh, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? His, his characteristic macho approach to Ukraine has been in the news recently where he said that he could solve the war in 24 hours. And in this prank call discussion, Lord Cameron has apparently expressed a lot of scepticism about the prospects of Trump being able to secure a peace deal, uh, if we could call it that, with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Cameron apparently argued that the issue here is that Trump believes Putin just wants Crimea. And Cameron's suspicion is that actually a widely held view, actually, that, that Putin wants much more than just Crimea. This is not just about isolated land grabs. This is, as we've discussed on the podcast before, a sort of almost imperial conquest. And so, as I said, he was expressing some scepticism about what Trump might actually uh, be able to achieve. And the thing about these pranksters is that when they call these people up, it's under the guise of not sure if you'd agree with this, Roland, but it seems to be under the guise of being for fun. But what's interesting is that they tend to target people that the Russian state is quite interested in. And they, they tend to ask questions which are sort of designed at poking fun at the people that they're speaking to in a geopolitical conquest. It's, it's not always just about ringing people up and making them look silly. There does often seem to be, a, like I said, a kind of political motivation behind it. And perhaps we can talk about these two uh, a bit later on. The, the other big diplomatic story today is, of course, the EU summit taking place in Brussels. President Zelensky is, is due to arrive shortly, and there's going to be the signing of a special security pact with Ukraine, uh, which will keep up the supply of weapons, military training, and other forms of aid for Kyiv. Uh, this will apparently cover nine areas of Ukrainian security policy, and I think the goal here is to reassure people that that is going to continue despite considerable turbulence in the European Union at the moment, not just the results of the EU elections, which gave a big victory to the to the far right, which tended to be quite Russia sympathetic, but also, of course, the fact that we it does often feel at the moment that we're in a bit of a holding pattern because the US election is nearly upon us and that seems to have paused or frozen a lot of the discussions on, uh, on, on Ukrainian aid. Uh, I'll just give you a short tweet from Zelensky. He says, in the past few days, Ukraine has started actual negotiations on EU membership 
And he says, today I'm in Brussels to attend a meeting of the European Council. And I just want to end with one more significant diplomatic uh, development. Poland, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia uh, have called on the EU to build a defensive line along the bloc's border with Russia and Belarus. That's according to AFP, I, I believe. And the goal is that they want to defend those eastern Baltic states from Moscow's uh, military and hybrid threats. As podcast listeners know, when we talk about hybrid threats, we mean Russian hybrid warfare, the attempt to sort of destabilize NATO allies, either by interfering in elections or by carrying out cyber t- attacks or through embarrassing leaks of sensitive information related to Ukraine. So that's the goal of, of that big defensive barrier. It's it's really quite ambitious, Roland. They're talking about 700 kilometers of defensive infrastructure. That's not just physical infrastructure like uh, fences. We're talking about drones, I understand, drone patrols and that sort of thing. And it's going to cost a, a not insignificant £2.1 billion, pounds, roughly. And of course, that is going to be discussed, I suspect, in detail at the EU summit in Brussels today. That's a very ambitious project. Perhaps we can talk a bit more about that in a moment, because Roland, as you know, you spent a lot of time uh, in that sort of border region. And it's it's not an easy border to, not necessarily an easy border to securitize. It's very open in some places. On the other hand, you know, the in- information coming out of Russia suggests that so many of the troops that used to be on the Russian side of the border have, have been moved elsewhere, including to Ukraine. Thank you very much for that, James. I just wanted to ask, I think, I think what's happening in Brussels is actually very interesting today. I mean, Zelensky is obviously there now, but, but he, he shows up, you know, at quite a delicate time in Europe. And Sunday we're going to have, you know, elections in France, uh, which may be won by Marine Le Pen's uh, national rally, who's, who's, you know, clearly has a different kind of attitude to the Ukraine war than Emmanuel Macron. We have the election here, of course, on, on Thursday. We don't really think that's going to change British policy towards Ukraine and the war. Has Zelensky been saying anything um, about that? Has he said anything about what, what's happening in France? Not yet, but I think the sort of the big concern about France is that we're seeing this evolution of um, Marine Le Pen's party. As you know, this used to be a party that was kind of considered beyond the pale in many parts of Europe. And um, she's done a lot of work uh, over many years, actually, to try and clean up uh, the party's image that started in 2017. and, And it sort of progressed to the point where Le Pen's party is almost seen as a sort of potential government in waiting. Something that may be being considered on the Ukrainian side is the fact that although in the past, traditionally, these these hard right, far right parties are quite Russia sympathetic, certainly the case uh, with with Le Pen and her uh, ilk uh, in the past. You can look at the case of Italy as a good example of how being a sort of right wing populist party doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be uh, a sort of foe of Ukraine. You know, I think that's a, that's actually an example where there was a sort of unexpected Italian surge. I think it might be reasonable to say in being constructive towards Ukraine. And so maybe that's something that they're that they're going to be thinking about. Inevitably, it, it will be discussed a lot, and perhaps also. The rise of the AFD, which performed very strongly in the European elections too, uh, much more unashamedly, as I said, sympathetic towards Russia. It's a party that's very sceptical of support for Ukraine, to put it mildly. And so I think those are going to be two areas that that certainly the Ukrainian delegation will be will be thinking about. And of course, the other thing, as we've discussed, will be uh, figuring out some kind of solution on ongoing support. I did open our paper this morning, actually, and there's a piece by uh, Peter Allen in Paris about National Rally being attacked for having a, a Russian dual national as a security advisor. This is a woman called Tamara Volkova. She's 34. She's a Russian-French dual national, but National Rally has vowed to ban dual national immigrants from key jobs if it comes to power. And, and what's more embarrassing is that she became a French citizen in 2020, despite a leaked report from the DGSC, France's domestic intelligence service, that identified her as a, a suspected agent of influence working for Vladimir Putin's Russia. So there's going to be big nerves, I imagine, in Kiev if, if, if this election, as, as many people are predicting, goes, goes Marine Le Pen's way. I think so. And it's becoming such a big part of European policymaking, actually, this concern that uh, people who are sympathetic towards Russia are increasing their, their influence in the European Union. And one example that also springs to mind, actually, which I think is worth talking about, is the case of Maximilian Krah. Now, Mr. Krah is a senior MEP for Germany's AFD party. 
He was the lead candidate in the European elections. And he got embroiled in a massive scandal just before the polls, pretty much just before the polls opened, kind of defending the SS in an interview with an Italian newspaper saying not everyone who wore an SS uniform was a, a criminal. On top of that, he is under investigation in Germany for accepting allegedly suspicious payments from Russia and China. And one of his staffers in the European Parliament was a few months ago arrested on suspicion of being a spy for Beijing. Uh, And the reason I bring this politician up is that going into uh, the European elections, this lead candidate for the AFD was was absolutely covered in scandal. He was banned from campaigning by the AFD, which is not quite as strong as stripping someone of their lead candidate status altogether, but it's still a sanction under this huge cloud of, of scandal. And despite that, Despite that, the AFD performed really quite strongly uh, in those European elections. And that suggests that in many parts of Germany, particularly in the East, people are not overly concerned by this sort of thing. This concern that people, uh, as I said, with sympathies for Russia, uh, are not just gaining in the polls, but also as a result of becoming an MEP. They will have access to all sorts of sensitive documents that might be getting circulated around European parliamentary committees and the like. And I understand that too is a a bit of a concern. It's also a big debate in Germany itself, actually, as as the populist parties get stronger and stronger, and they start to sit on committees, and they start to play a bigger role in in public life. If, If one of your concerns is avoiding embarrassing leaks to the Russians, deliberate or accidental, such as the Luftwaffe leaks that you might remember, Roland, when some top German Air Force officers were discussing potential deliveries of tourist missiles to Ukraine and the Russians leaked it everywhere. It's definitely something that people are thinking about a lot more. And of course, it comes against a wider backdrop of hybrid warfare that we touched upon earlier in the context of the Baltic states, as I said, trying to step up their defences against hybrid threats. We've got uh, the issue of not just the cyber attacks and the leaks, but there's also a lot of suspicion about sabotage attacks uh, You know, across the European Union. We've seen these suspicious fires in Poland and indeed in Germany. Uh, There was the arson attack in East London uh, on a Ukraine-linked business as well. And so all of this this stuff is actually getting really febrile. We said it before, but I think it's worth saying again, you know, it it, it really does feel like we've entered a sort of second Cold War now in that context. And, And that complicates an already very difficult picture in terms of the immediate context of the fighting in Ukraine. Mm. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I just wanted to add on that note. It, it neatly brings us back to um, to David Cameron talking to those two Russian pranksters there. As you said, a, a pair of chaps called Vovan and Lexus. Um, they've been around for years. They really kind of came to prominence in the in the 2010s. Um, and as you say, they tend to, you know, they start out with these kind of TV pranksters who ring up prominent people and get them to to say silly things. And then they began to target people of international interest. They've done Mikhail Gorbachev, John McCain, Elton John, famously. They're widely thought to be kind of, you know, close to the FSB, to be directed in, in, in one way or another. But it's interesting, actually, looking at what David Cameron said. I mean, we ran a story, you know, given we're running into an election, that Lord Cameron had kind of embarrass the, the the conservative party campaign because the conservative party was attacked labor on uh, on security asked by the imposter if he believed anything would change after the general election lord cameron said the opposition party is as enthusiastic about defending ukraine and helping ukraine as the conservative party i don't think you'll see change obviously if they win it will be a new government there will be some getting up to speed on some issues but i think fundamentally they've supported everything we've done I think the Labour Party, if they win, will continue that approach. You know, suggested David Lammy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, didn't have much experience. Lord Cameron replied, no, that's true. But I think the British policy is fixed, which is is kind of a contrast to what you're describing in Europe. We do have the sense here in Britain that there is a quite a deep political consensus, which despite, um, you know, recent remarks by Nigel Farage, isn't really shifting that you, as you very well described from there in Berlin, there is that sense um, that things might shift elsewhere in Europe. James, um, we've been talking for a while. Um, I just wanted to remind our listeners that 
this Saturday, on the 29th of June, Ukraine the Latest will be doing a live panel at the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough in the northeast of England. The show will be in the early evening. Uh, so Dominic, David, Francis Stanley, and myself will be discussing the military lessons for the West from two years of the full-scale invasion. For tickets, just go to the Scarborough Fair website or follow the link we've put in the show notes. We'd really look forward to to seeing you there. James, I just reminds me to ask if you have any um any final thoughts today yeah i think for my final thoughts it's the presence of those north korean troops um over in occupied eastern ukraine we've been following this story for a long time now the growing rapprochement of of putin with kim jong-un and also there was of course that trip to vietnam recently and above everything else iran which has become a very significant military supporter of russia we've talked before about the ways in which this feels dangerously close to a sort of global armament preceding potentially a global conflict. And even if from the sort of worm's eye view, it looks like some North Korean soldiers coming over to eastern Ukraine and rebuilding a building that's been blown up by the Russians or whatever it might be. The bigger picture here does seem to be a quite concerning emerging global alliance between those countries, most worrisome of all for the West, inevitably Iran as well. Um, And I think this is something that's worth watching very, very closely. I I think there is inevitably potential for uh, escalation here if it actually emboldens Putin, uh, this sense that he's building a a security partnership. And the other point that I'd make on on, on North Korea, finally, is that we often... think of North Korea as this basket case economy. You know, we think of Kim Jong-un sometimes as this kind of almost comical leader um, because of the way that he is presented in this sort of quasi-godlike status by uh, propaganda and state TV. Uh, But if they are getting closely involved in this war, even if it's just uh, indirect military support, I I think that for many people will be a real source of concern. James, thanks. I was going to forego my own final thought since i'm in 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 david's seat but i did just want to say i think i think you're quite right to highlight that as you quite rightly said there's no suggestion at the moment that these north korean troops are going to be in combat but that said we didn't think that they would be going there at all and there is a pattern in history is there not of of long-running large wars beginning to draw in allies other countries this dangerous internationalization um as he said. For many months, Russia has been hammering Ukraine's energy infrastructure, targeting power plants and interconnectors. The goal seems to be the destruction of normal life for millions of Ukrainians across the country. My colleague David Knowles spoke to Dmitro Sahro, the executive director of Ukraine's largest privately owned energy company, DTEC, to understand Ukraine's energy crisis and find out what may happen next. Dimitri, thank you so much for your time. Would you start just by introducing yourself uh, to our listeners? Yes, my name is uh, Dimitri Sakharuk. I'm an executive director of uh, DTEC Group. I'm based in Kiev in, uh, in Ukraine. Dimitri, can you explain to us just how bad the energy crisis, uh, the energy war is in Ukraine right now? Yes, I guess this is the biggest crisis in energy during the whole history of Ukrainian state, Ukrainian independence because uh, half of uh, Ukrainian generation that was available before March 22nd, this is the date when the first attack happened, uh, was lost. Basically, 9 gigawatt of installed capacity was damaged or destroyed by Russian attacks. We had two attacks in March, 22nd, 29, two attacks in April, uh, two in May, basically, and uh, two in June. So those attacks uh, were pretty, unfortunately, efficient. The Russians sent a lot of missiles, drones uh, in combination, plus various types of uh, missiles were used from the usual one to, to ballistic, that were pretty advanced and speedy, speedy missile that very difficult to intercept. Uh, somebody needs a very, only a very advanced uh, air defense system to intercept them, uh, namely Patriot, IRST, or NASA systems. Uh, and uh, because it's impossible to to intercept uh, using other uh, less advanced, less uh, developed uh, air defense systems. So as a result, they destroyed uh, uh, thermal power plants, uh, hydro plants, uh, 
and uh, the CHPs uh, and the substations of uh, system operator is to transport electricity from one part of Ukraine to another. Speaking, for example, about DTEC, uh, we had uh, six uh, thermal power plants uh, um, operated by one of our companies named uh, DTEC Energy and uh, five gigawatt of installed capacity. Right now, as a result of those attacks, we have only 400. 90% 90% of uh, generation capacity was uh, destroyed or damaged. And uh, speaking about what to do, uh, first of all, it's an uh, issue about air defense. Even in cases when we, as Ukraine, have um, air defense located next to the crucial facilities, uh, namely power plants or thermal power plants or the hydro power plants, and the air defense uh, did not have enough munition. So, for example, the full load of a system is 12 missiles that may intercept incoming Russian missiles, but in reality, there were only two or one. And of course, it's difficult to intercept incoming 10 missiles uh, using only one uh, missile, which is impossible. And just to give you an example, uh, two days ago, uh, one of our plants was uh, uh, attacked again. And there were two units running that we already uh, restored after the previous three attacks, three times. And the last attack uh, was, um, uh, during the last attack, Russians used six missiles. So the air defense intercepted four because they had only four missiles loaded in their defense system. And the remaining two uh, missiles arrived to, to the target. The boiler exploded, uh, three people were, were, were injured, our employees, because of the explosion. And the damage is so big that we would need more than six months to repair that, boiler, that exploded boiler. And the main reason why it was so efficient just because the air defense system lacked munition. So this is the task number one, uh, because even if we may recover, even if we recover something, we restore something. Unfortunately, uh, the task how to save uh, the recovered or still existent uh, generation or transmission capacities, this is a key, key task. And here, our allies may help us definitely to provide more missiles for the provided air defense, to provide more air defense, and probably to distribute missiles in so-called uh, protected mode, basically, to allocate a specific number of missiles exactly for those air defense systems that are located specifically for the protection of the crucial infrastructure facilities ensuring that they have not less than, say, 80% of their uh, load. Otherwise, uh, that m- the recovery may be a kind of monkey job. It's over and over again, you recover and then they shoot and again destroy. And uh, in some cases, we may come to the point that it would be impossible to recover and restore because they use pretty advanced uh, missiles. They have... Uh, load of explosion 500 kilos 800 kilos and it's a huge one basically this is uh, traditional war missiles used to work on the the air carriers and other big uh, military facilities the second task uh, would be of course to restore and recover what we may recover until the uh, the coming winter uh, this is still the quickest and the cheapest way to 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 be prepared for the coming winter. Um, why we do need this? Because the existing deficit, even taking a, uh, in account that the weather is okay right now, uh, approximately twenty five percent in the country. It means that uh, 35 percent of uh, of uh, population is uh, without power right now because Ukrainerga is using so called planned or scheduled outages that's to decrease the consumption in order to uh, balance uh, balance the consumption with ability to produce energy in Ukraine. Uh, so 
to recover and restore the damaged facilities, we may we are using uh, several strategies. First of all, we try to uh, find uh, second-hand used equipment uh, in uh, at old plants uh, located in Europe, mainly in eastern part of Europe, because many of power plants were built here during Soviet Union era, and majority of them are not in operation anymore. But uh, we may find there the old equipment that may be dismantled and brought uh, to Ukraine. Of course, that will be a Frankenstein kind of equipment, Frankenstein units, and it does not cover the whole need of 20-25% of what we need, but still, this is the cheapest and the quickest way. So, restoration and uh, resources for that is the second task. The third one is increase of import. We, as a country, right now import 1.7 gigawatt of energy every hour, this is the uh, existent limit that was established by NTSOE. This is the association of uh, energy or the, the uh, system operators of Europe. The technical capacity right now that may be used is 3.5 gigawatt. The difference uh, from 3.5 gigawatt, which is the technical ability and existent permitted 1.7, this is the calculation made by the technicians or engineers of the SOE, taking into consideration the stability of the grid, the reservation of the grid, etc., just to make sure that the system uh, works uh, uh, in stable mode. However, we do believe that uh, increase of the allowed uh, 1.7 up to 2.2 or 2.5 gigawatt is possible without any significant damage to stability and interoperability of various parts of uh, energy systems of Europe and Ukraine. And Ukraine right now is an integrated part of the, uh, of, the Ukraine, of the European energy system. So this is a task number three, in addition to air defense, restoration, increase of import. And last one is the uh, construction of distributed generation, which everybody is uh, talking about right now uh, and here we speak about uh, uh, solar panels uh, on the roofs uh, of the households we're speaking about the gas turbines uh, uh, engines uh, gas or diesel engines that may be installed all big generators however we should understand that uh, they may that uh, strategy may help only to ensure the small consumers, relatively small consumers like households or small consumers like one hospital, maybe one school, but definitely it's not possible to use uh, this type of generation to feed the supply with power, for example, the big districts in the, in the city, in Kiev region, uh, Kiev, uh, city of Kiev, because it's like difference in, in, in many times, uh, for example, for a district in Kiev, you would need uh, 50 30 megawatt uh, power and the generator or gas turbine may produce significantly less. So, and plus time that you would need to, to install it because this is not only about uh, bringing turbine, it's designing, connection, uh, uh, connection to gas, connection to grid, uh, land allocation, uh, and basically the procurement itself because there is no a big stock of turbines available on the market that may be easily uh, brought to Ukraine um, in the required volumes. The president of Ukraine in Berlin promised that uh, Ukraine will build up to one gigawatt of installed capacity of gas turbines in Ukraine until the end uh, of the year. That is a very challenging task. That requires a lot of resources because the rough estimation of only cost one megawatt of gas turbine costs roughly one million. So one gigawatt is one billion dollars needed to, to build this. It's a huge, uh, huge, uh, huge uh, amount of money needed. And definitely in a situation of a very short period of time that we have until the uh, beginning of the heating season. Basically, we're talking right now about 120 days. It's impossible to build it in a centralized way, right? So uh, no state-owned company could build one gigawatt in so short period of time. Only private sector may do this. However, the private sector would need capital for that because it's again a huge amount of money needed. 
and to attract private capital to the private sector. Several conditions, as usual, should be met because nobody will provide this capital without uh, following the usual conditions uh, uh, for the providing money. First of all, it's protection of protection of uh, investments in this case. Sorry, this is the air defense. Uh, we will need a pause for this for a second. I guess this is again. So uh, we would definitely need uh, protection of investments and we are talking about the war insurance. Uh, there are only first steps in this uh, field. The coverage that's been provided like two, five, ten million dollars for war insurance, but we are talking that we need to cover one billion dollars to build one gigawatt. So it's a big gap between what currently existent or available on the market and what is needed. Second, of course, the protection. Uh, I'm talking about air defense because nobody will build even the gas turbines because they will be, be physically destroyed. So that the insurance needed, and uh, in terms of uh, return of cap uh, capital for the investments, definitely the currency regulation should be uh, relaxed because right now the private company could not purchase uh, dollars for Grima to, uh, to repay to their to, to, to their uh, creditors. So those conditions are not met and there are very big uh, risks uh, that uh, available the, the capital will be available for the private sector to build this one gigawatt of capacity. But again, the strategy, the, the fourth step, uh, fourth measure for strategy to build the distributed, distributed energy, this is the right one. But the momentum will be later, the crucial mass will be created that will have an impact on the ability of Ukraine to go through the winter will be created later. So we lost nine gigawatts. You know, definitely uh, to build uh, a meaningful portion of distributed energy to at least partially substitute the lost capacity uh, will take time. And if not 120 days, it will definitely take uh, much longer. Dimitri, you said earlier in your answer that the missiles that are targeting your plants are that big, 500 kilograms of, of munitions, they're proper war missiles that they should be fired at military targets. What do, you, what do you think the Russian strategy, the aim here is in targeting Ukrainian thermal plants? So I guess they just found a proper window for using their missiles before, because before that, uh, the air defense in Ukraine was much more efficient because uh, they had, the Ukrainian army had enough munition to intercept 80 plus percent of incoming missiles. But when we saw that uh, the support from the United States, from Europe, paused for six months, it's just again caused by delay of voting in the U.S. Senate. Um, they just exhausted our defense by sending numerous uh, drones in January, in December, January, uh, February. And then when we find out that we are empty, they just started sending uh, their missile, understanding that we will not be able to intercept them. And unfortunately, their strategy was, was right. Today, June the 25th, the International Criminal Court has announced that it's issued arrest warrants for Russia's Chief of the General Staff, that's Valery Gerasimov, and Secretary of the Security Council, Sergei Shoigu. Some of the charges relate to Russian strikes on Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Um, what's your reaction to this announcement by the ICC that they're pursuing these criminal these criminal charges? This is a very good and right decision, definitely. Uh, however, as always, the question was enforcement. How will we be able to enforce the decision? The only way, as I understand, is the power, uh, the power, military power, because Russians uh, stops only where they are being stopped by power. Unless they see that uh, there is no way ahead, they will continue pushing. Uh, that's why uh, we need uh, more military strengths to stop them. Otherwise, uh, this decision of the court will be just uh, a declaration that would uh, never be implemented in reality. 
Dimitri, earlier you talked about the blackouts on Ukrainian civilians um, to reduce the energy demand on, on the grid. Um, could you give our listeners a sense of what that means in practice? How have people had to change their lives? What do they have to do um, to, 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 to live as normally as possible despite the blackouts? What, ha- what actually happens? Yeah, this, from a practical point of view, it means that in uh, uh, flats, uh, apartments, uh, households, People don't have energy during uh, from two to four, I sometimes seven hours. Then a short uh, short period with power from two to four hours, and then and this cycle starts again. So up to 12, 14, 16, sometimes 18 hours during the day, our civilians do not have power. Uh, so during these uh, gaps when there is no power definitely they could not uh, do their normal they, they, they could not live their normal lives right because power right now is a crucial uh, commodity so they could not cook uh, some hot food uh, they could not uh, use elevators uh, usually there is no water because pumps that pump uh, water on the high high floors uh, do not work Mm, uh, and it's create a lot of uh, disc- in- inconvenience, of course, and in some cases, uh, very difficult uh, situation for those who could not, for example, go down and up for the high floors uh, if there is no elevator. For example, in my case, uh, I have a father-in-law who is 77, had uh, three uh, heart surgeries, uh, and uh, he lives uh, in my apartment uh, on the 18th floor. So for him, uh, it's just impossible to go down and up uh, on the 18th floor, physically impossible, and take the mom with uh, mom with small kids uh, that also stuck in their flats and uh, take uh, people who need uh, the, the assistance, right, uh, to move that use wheels, for example. So it's just, it's just, it's just impossible. And uh, usually, in, again, in my case, there is no water on the 18th floor. So during this uh, fifth, uh, five or seven hours, so you would need to somehow manage to keep, the, to have spare uh, water in some buckets just to, to use it. And um, regarding power, people install a lot of batteries, uh, uh, inventors, in, inverters, uh, they install generators, uh, Households that have roofs install solar panels uh, in combination with, uh, with the storage uh, to make sure that they have some power. Of course, it's expensive, and not all may afford to do to do this. Uh, other people buy power banks, uh, buy the source of uh, light, like a small small uh, lights, uh, charge them and use uh, in the daily life. And it's a good thing right now, people, kids are on uh, summer vacation, so they don't study in the schools, uh, but uh, in September, in September, they will go to school again, and that will create a lot of problems for schools, a lot of problems for kids that should do their homeworks, for example, they need to study, they need light, and uh, if uh, the day will be much shorter than today. And I doubt that all of them will have um, good uh, conditions for studying. Plus, uh, connections, uh, things there is no power. Usually, the uh, the um, cells, uh, the towers that are used to provide signal for the phones do not uh, work because the batteries die after three, four hours, and uh, some districts are mm, without uh, mobile connection. Uh, and you could not use internet, you could not make calls just because there is no signal uh, that is available for your mobile phone. That creates even worse conditions that, that you could not, for example, call for emergency, a medical assistant or law enforcement agencies just because your phone does not work. Not uh, all people, a uh, majority of people do not have landlines uh, for many years already, because uh, for some 10 years, people usually prefer using their mobile phones. But uh, that absence of the connection creates a lot of uh, problems. So those are the examples how the outages uh, outages create difficulties uh, in um, usual life. Is that the same across Ukraine? It's a very big country. Is that the same in Lviv as it is in Kiev or other regional differences? The same. Same. 
Looking, you've mentioned it a few times, but looking ahead to the autumn and the winter, it seems as if at the moment, as you said, the school, the children aren't in school. It's very warm outside. But when the heating season comes, when temperatures start to drop, if you don't get the help you need, how close are we to a humanitarian catastrophe? Very close, because uh, it's possible to be in the apartment uh, without power, but it's impossible to be there to stay there if there is no heating and worse sewage and water so uh crucial infrastructure should be also powered right and if uh, the balance of generation will go beyond the uh, level required to power the crucial infrastructure like heating sewage water then that will be definitely a humanitarian catastrophe in the scale of uh, some cities or even the whole country. Because in winter, if you, you understand if uh, the uh, liquids uh, will, uh, will freeze in, for example, the heating system, from physics point of view, it will destroy the, uh, it will destroy the, uh, the pumps, right? Because the water will become bigger when it's uh, freezing. And uh, it means that the heating system will be destroyed uh, by the spring. You will not be able to repair it. And that will be a, a, a catastrophe that uh, would require, I mean, uh, will, there is no solution what to do with millions of people living in, uh, living in big cities without heat, water, surge. That definitely a, a disaster. Dimitri, is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think is important for our listeners um, to hear and understand? I guess I would like only emphasize the importance of air defense because this is the most and the crucial, con- the most important and the most crucial condition for the ability of Ukraine to fight further in this war. Uh, air defense and munition to air defense. Uh, we should understand that Russians sent to us 100 plus uh, missiles every, every during every attack, and we definitely need hundreds of missiles for the existing uh, air defense systems and new air defense systems. Everything else is possible to do, basically to recover, to restore. But if you could not protect yourself from big missiles falling from the sky that definitely create huge uncertainty of uh, Ukraine and decrease the significantly decrease the ability of the country to to fight and win in this war. Dimitri, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and to stay on top of all our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at telegraph.co.uk forward stroke Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss out. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on X, formerly known as Twitter. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear, Rachel Porter and Georgia Cohn. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.